Hi, everyone. I'm glad you're here because today's episode is a doozy. Today, I have three stories that nearly shattered everyone involved as they tried to rationalize what happened to them. Just wait until you hear what you're about to hear. So if you're enjoying the channel, don't be invisible. Let us know you're out there and smash that subscribe button so we can always be together. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. There's an entire city floating on the Caspian Sea. It's sinking, but it's there. 300 kilometers of bridges, roadways, complexes, and oil rigs. I worked there for four years. It was a perilous and thankless job. Most of the world doesn't know that oil rocks exists. The money I made was good, though. It kept me out of trouble for a while, too. Unfortunately for me and every poor soul working these rigs, trouble came to oil rocks. It came for us, and we couldn't escape it. Out there, trouble rolled in like the fog. The first guy disappeared a year and a half in. He vanished off the side of the rig. No splash, no nothing. The ocean has a way of swallowing you whole, I guess. It's swallowing the whole city. Regardless, we should have known something was up then. They kept his disappearance quiet, the higher-ups. When we asked to review the security footage from the area he was working, they outright refused. Red flag, right? The thing about red flags is they're still so easy to ignore. It isn't red or green or any color at all if you decide to just look the other way. And sometimes it even takes time. Well, that's what we did. Look the other way. We looked away and we went on with our lives, working in the middle of the Caspian Sea. After that disappearance, we had a few more months of peace. Then, we only had trouble. I wish I could say I had seen it first. I didn't. I did hear it, though. One night, the whole ocean sounded like it was croaking. It sounded like a sea of frogs. None of us could see anything in the dark water, but the company assured us that it was just the sound of migrating whales. Now, I've heard whales before. I've seen and studied whales. Those sounds were not coming from any whale that lives in our sea. It came back a couple of nights later, and this time there was a splash because we heard another man hit the water. At least we knew where to look. We got a flotation device in his arms and we were hoisting him up in no time. A few blankets later and the guy was right as rain, toasty and chatting us up. Escaping death is pretty exciting, I guess. He said somebody pushed him. He knew he'd been alone in the area and every other guy was accounted for. Nobody living on oil rocks could have reached him, let alone thrown him over the railing. We mandated a buddy system after that. But Trouble didn't care about our buddy system. It came for us in twos. Two guys that I started with were the next to encounter the croaking thing from the Caspian Sea. They were attacked. Maimed would be a better description. The company had to bury their injuries under the guise of an equipment malfunction. We work with some heavy machinery, but nothing that could cut you like that guy got cut. It was ugly. They lived, as far as I know. Over the course of the next three weeks, more and more of us started to see it. My buddy described it as a man with a head of seaweed for hair. Others said it looked like an alien. I saw it one time just the once, as it slipped off the rig and fell into the ocean. It's hard to describe, I guess. There's nothing to compare it to in a way that feels justified. It had arms like a man, and it had legs like a man. I thought I saw hands, webbed fingers, coming out of all four of those limbs. Its skin was thick and warty like a toad or a frog. I forget which one. Its stomach was bulbous and fat. Its eyes were wide-set, large, and red. It turns my stomach just to think about that face. And it hurts to think about the long mouth and the rows of needlepoint teeth. It wasn't a whale, I'll tell you that much. It was a nightmare. I spotted it as it fled another point of attack. It had come for one of the ladies working at Oil Rocks. She was smarter than the rest of us, apparently, because she picked up a wrench and taught that thing a lesson. She was covered then in a mucus-like blood that certainly was not hers. And that was when the Iranians showed up. Government types. They only gave their credentials to our superiors. The rest of us just did what they said. Quarantine. Some of us were sent home, myself included. 
the lady covered in that mucus was hauled back to the mainland. I don't know what became of her, and I never wanted to ask. The last thing that she had said to any of us was, It's starting to burn. Can you imagine that? Being covered in the blood of something that tried to kill you, and the slime is starting to give you a rash? The way she said it, I'll never forget. Starting to burn. Starting. She was scratching and patting at her skin like smoke was coming off of it. And then, they took her away. So, if the burning was only starting, what came next? Did they take her to a hospital or a lab? I guess I'm just lucky that I wasn't with her. Over those next few weeks, we were forced to accept a very hard truth. Out there on oil rocks, we fancied ourselves the smartest things around. We went looking for privacy, thinking we could demand it from nature. Nature had a different plan for us. Nature taught us that no matter how many bridges we build or how many rigs we stab into the earth, we are not the masters of the ocean or the land. We weren't even safe on the structures that we built. At any point in time, something can rush up from the dark and drag us back into the depths. Hi, my name is Roy, and I have a story to tell you from my childhood. I grew up with an older brother. At the time this happened, I was seven and he was nine. We used to play all the time in the spring and summer in a very large patch of woods directly behind our house. We spent hours and hours back there playing, playing swords with sticks, building tree forts, pretending to start fires, cops and robbers, you name it. We spent hours exploring, looking at bugs, trying to find buried treasure like any kids do. All the good stuff. We tried to spend the majority of our free time outside when we could, mainly because inside offered us no entertainment. My parents didn't have a TV, no game systems, nothing. We had a few books here and there, but nothing my brother and I were interested in, so we would try to spend all of our time outside and live like real kids do. But that changed halfway during a summer when I was seven and he was nine. We were playing outside. I remember we had a game of hide and seek going. Well, I was it, and so I counted to 50. This time, before I could even finish counting though, he comes running back, screaming all the way back to the house. It completely caught me off guard, totally by surprise. Then I thought he was pranking me or trying to joke with me. So I laughed and I ran after him but he was just bawling hysterically, crying and screaming and running to the back door. I chased after him and tried to get him to slow down, but he didn't. He didn't even acknowledge me. He was in a total state of shock and fear. When he got to the back door, I finally caught up with him. My mom was busy doing something inside, so it took her a minute, if not more, to get to the back door. She usually kept it locked. I had never seen my brother in my life so overtaken by pure, raw emotion as that fear that he had. It wasn't until a little later, even my mom was freaked out, that she was able to get him to calm down. But it was days before he would tell any of us exactly what happened. He just said that he saw something, but we really couldn't get anything out of him. And then days after that, he told me what it was. It was about a week later, and he asked me if I could keep a secret. I said yes. Even more so, being only seven years old, you want to do anything to stand by your older brother. He told me that he saw a real werewolf, and that he was running to hide. He was walking up to him from behind a tree, reaching out to grab him. That's what he said. He said it was big and hairy, covered in dark black fur with huge fangs and large eyes and ears. It scared him so bad that he ran. He was pretty serious about it, too. He was very shaken up. Retelling the story at nine years old wasn't easy. Plus, he had no desire to go back into the woods for the rest of the year, which was a huge loss for both of us. We just stayed inside, and we were bored the rest of the summer. Now that we're both in our late 20s, I ask him about it sometimes. He basically just tells me what I've told you already that he believes he saw some sort of a creature that resembled a werewolf. He's pretty firm in his belief that vampires, mummies, werewolves don't exist, but there are animals out there that have some resemblance to them. I mean, 
That's a lot more plausible than the idea of an actual werewolf existing. But even now, he describes it to a T. Basically says exactly what he did when he was nine. It stood up on two legs. It was covered in dark black fur that was really thick. Kind of like a shaggy dog. Long, gangly, very unkempt. Like it had been rolling around in dirt and filth and muck. He said its face was somewhere of a cross between a German shepherd and a wolf. A very pronounced brow ridge like some monkeys have, and very, very long ears that were very pointed, and a long muzzle, and huge, sharp canines. This thing was walking towards him, extending both of its arms like it was going to grab him, but it made no effort to run after him, or move any faster than at a casual slow pace, even after my brother started running. The whole thing is weird, he says, but it is what it is. The following spring and summer, we continued to play back in those woods, and we never had any problems afterwards. We then moved out of that house and all the way across town when we were 15 and 13. That's my story, or should I say, my brother's story. I never saw or heard anything. I live outside the incredibly small town of Weaverville in Northern California. Basically, I live in the sticks. I believe I saw something, some kind of animal, some creature that I'm not quite sure what it is. I can't explain it, but the only description I can give you is that it resembled that of a Great Dane, except standing on two legs. The only connection I have is when I grew up, I was very close to my aunt. She always had two Great Danes with her. My entire upbringing, anytime one would die, she would get another. It was very odd, so that has always stuck with me. What I saw that night closely resembled that exactly of a Great Dane. In fact, I even suspected it was one at first and was wondering how weird it was that it was walking around. But on closer inspection, even though it was as large and as tall and lanky, it resembled more of a coyote from what I could tell. Very, very slender. Its legs were a little more muscular than that of a dog's, but still it had the hocks and everything. It stared at me from the wood line, glowing red orbs for eyes, but not like monster red. They were just a warm red glow, but an unnatural glow, if anything. I wasn't really afraid as much as I was confused. It seemed to be watching me very nervously, like it had gotten caught doing something and was waiting for me to leave. I don't know. It doesn't really make sense, but that's the vibe I got from it. At the time, I was in my backyard splitting firewood when I happened to look up and see this thing staring at me. My backyard isn't the largest, but those trees do go on for quite a while. I want to say another five, six miles. I could be way off, but I know it's a ways back. I've only seen this animal once. This was about three months ago, right at the height of summer. I've never seen it since, nor heard of it, and I've no idea what it could be. From what I know, it could possibly be some sort of a rabid wild dog, although I've never heard of rabid wild dogs around here, and by themselves, and especially ones that look like Coyote Great Danes. This occurred many, many moons ago when I was a young boy with my father on a hunting trip up in Alaska. For a long time, I never believed in creatures, until this particular hunting trip with my father, when I saw, with my own eyes, my father too, a creature rip out the throat of an adult male grizzly bear. We saw it through my dad's rifle scope. Now I'm older and time has passed and I've had time to process what kind of animal I saw, there's no doubt in my mind that this was a full-on battle between the alphas of the woods. My father wasn't intentionally hunting bear. We were just up on a high perch and my dad was scoping around with his binoculars. After looking about 300 yards out, give or take, he spotted something incredibly large which turned out to be a male adult grizzly bear. He told me, son, take a look at this and he handed me the rifle with the scope. As he continued to look through binoculars, I looked in the direction he pointed and I could see that something even larger was coming upon the grizzly bear. 
My dad, who appeared just as shocked as I was, didn't know what animal could be bigger than a grizzly, and what this large, dark shape descending upon the bear from behind could be. We both watched in horror as this thing moved quickly and jumped on the back of the grizzly bear. We then took turns looking through the scope. It appeared to be a giant wolf that looked very human-like. It then reached around and grabbed the bear by the throat, dug in and ripped it apart in one fluid motion, silently. My dad started hollering and freaking out since he was unsure what we were witnessing or what this thing could be. He said, son, I've never seen a wolf do that or get that big. I didn't realize Alaska had these kinds of wolves up here. What we witnessed that day was like watching a trained assassin sneak up on an innocent victim and execute a kill perfectly without any hesitation, without any struggle. And to do that to an adult male grizzly bear? If you know anything about grizzly bears, they are huge, massive killing machines. You don't want to cross a grizzly. After this wolf thing killed the grizzly bear, that was it. There was no eating it, it just left it deserted it. Quickly. Fast. We didn't even see where it went. It was like a blur. It was just gone. My father was more shocked than anything, and because I was so young and naive, I wasn't quite fully processing and understanding what we had seen. But my dad just kept telling me over and over, son, I had no idea there were wolves like that up here that got that big or that fast. And there was something different about that wolf, he told me something he couldn't explain. I almost wonder if he was afraid to truly tell me and to go into the details of what he really thought it was. He didn't want to scare me being a young boy. That's what I think. There isn't much else to the story. It was basically a quick kill. The grizzly bear didn't even have time to react to what was going on. It was amazing. And this thing, had we not been paying attention, we would have never even heard it make a noise. That's the one thing that scares me. It was completely silent. Never made a noise from moving to the bear, to moving outside of the area, even when it killed it. It was the perfect assassin, right before our very eyes. Something my father and I still talk about to this day.